On this video, we talk about emotional oversharing and how it pushes people away. Stay tuned. Welcome to The New Love Addiction. I'm Alan Robarge, a relationship coach and a psychotherapist. And I wanna talk about emotional oversharing and how it impacts our relationships. I was introduced to this idea through the book Facing Love Addiction by Pia Melody. And in that book, there is a phrase uh, that uh, states, share your reality in moderation. And I can remember years ago, I happened to be living in Chicago at the time, I have the book Facing Love Addiction. I stumble upon this phrase, share your reality in moderation. I was so perplexed. I could tell I needed to understand this. This means something here. And simultaneously, I had no idea what the heck does that mean? Where did the, how do I even apply that idea? It was so fascinating at how I felt it was fascinating observing that I had no reference point. Like, what does it mean to share your reality in moderation? So we're talking specifically, it applies to emotional sharing and emotional vulnerability, emotional openness, uh, being authentic and having a certain amount of emotional intelligence and an ease in which a person can uh, offer up what is going on in one's inner world? What's, how do I feel? Uh, what do I think, what do I notice about this situation? What's happening between us? And there's a very um, immediate and uh, um, quick disclosure to reveal uh, what I'm thinking and what I'm feeling. Now, there's a goodness to this. I mean, there's to explore this idea. It's it's a little bit of a paradox, and it's a little um, uh, um, confusing because simultaneously having a depth of emotional intelligence and being able to have the skill to go to the place of emotional sharing is a quite amazing skill to have. And we uh, benefit in our relationships, in any type of relationship, from uh, being able to uh, share what is going on for us, uh, how do we feel about a certain situation, and then also be able to name interpersonal dynamics. Um, there's a goodness to that. So of course we, uh, still value knowing that we're capable of doing this. The focus isn't so much on um, not being able to do this. The focus is on how we do it and when we do it. And is it done in the context of mutual disclosure between uh, the two people who are interacting with the person that we're interacting with? that oftentimes when there's a oversharing, that means that there's an imbalance, there's an incongruence. We lack the skill to identify and read the cues of the context of whether or not such level of emotional disclosure, emotional sharing, emotional vulnerability, emotional openness is even merited from the point of view of a person who is uh, overly identified with emotional expression and emotional process, uh, we would we just assume that that's the norm and that everybody wants to do that. Now, the challenge, the problem is that not everybody wants to do this and not everybody is capable to engage on this level. So there's a additional function of this level of oversharing. And some of us are conscious of this and some of us are not. This additional function of the emotional oversharing is that it does the opposite of what we assume it would do. 
it actually does not endear people to us. It does not invite people in to connect on deeper levels of emotional exchange. It can do just the opposite. It can push people away. It's a kind of smoke and mirrors approach to uh, protecting oneself, one's vulnerability. So I'm coming across very quickly, very strong, very self-assured of my emotional openness. And when I, when I do that, it can, I don't want to say it frightens someone, doesn't scare someone, but it, I mean, obviously there's some people who are frightened of emotion, but it, it can overwhelm another person in such a way that they are taken aback by uh, such level of emotional openness and maybe even be slightly intrigued with the what appears to be um, uh, a sophisticated skill. And it's this ease, the ease in which a person can share on this emotional level um, becomes a bit off-putting. And we can gauge through noticing how other people respond. We can gauge through their body language. We can tell whether we're conscious of it or not. We're picking up on these cues. We can tell when this behavior is actually um, protecting us because it's pushing people away. Now, there's a sadness here. There's a confused, let me, let me think how I would say this. We have a need to connect. That's why we're sharing in the first place. We're simultaneously uh, have understandable fears of being vulnerable. So the way we're managing our fear is we're not recoiling or hiding, we're actually oversharing. And this level of vulnerability, we can pick up that the other person is um, somewhat overwhelmed, um, might not fully be able to join us in that place. And when we can tell, again, it's mostly subconscious. We usually, you know, we're not trying to be manipulative and think about this. But when we know another person that we're with begins to shy away and let us take the lead of the emotional disclosure, we are safe in that moment. We are protected in the vulnerable exchange or in the exchange of vulnerability because we know the other person's not going to one-up us. We know the other person is not going to be able to challenge us to be even more emotionally open or vulnerable or available. Now, sometimes you might meet that person, and I've met that person before. People, you know, I meet other people who they are able to join me in that place, but in fact, then they show me their skill and capacity to be even more emotionally open than I have been in that moment. And something very fascinating happens. I shut down. I begin, I do just the same thing. I, I now shy away. I all of a sudden am a bit quiet. I'm not as free and engaged in, in the conversation. So it's a very fascinating dynamic. And what's underneath it, what is fueling all of this has to do with the insecurity around vulnerability. We need to think in terms of our family history. We need to think in terms, it could be adult relationships, but many of us learn this skill in our families. We were in families, there, there had to have been some capacity, or not capacity, there had to have been some experience of being ignored or neglected or abandoned. And I really like the word ignored because it encompasses a whole range of everyday interactions. It could be rather benign and mild and um, these very simple interactions that on surface level seem like, you know, people in a family are just going about their day and going about their business. 
But what's actually happening is the child's being ignored. And there's this re reoccurring um, multiple experiences of being ignored. And over time, the child is realizing that their emotional needs are not getting met. The child, again, this is usually subconscious, but we have to figure out some way to get emotional engagement with people who are not engaged. So there's a rather simple, uh, the simplicity of how one would respond is to overcompensate. Well, I guess I just have to try a little harder. I need to be a little bigger. I need to overcompensate for the other person's lack of engagement. And so I'm just gonna engage a little more. And I'm able to do this not only through um, uh, actual content of a conversation, I can overcompensate emotionally. So that if I need my emotional needs to get met, I have to be a little bigger, I have to be a little more direct, I have to be a little more obvious, and I cannot hold back. I need to, I cannot be afraid to just emotionally be very open. Now, there's something interesting about this dynamic because what also happens in all of those times when we're alone by ourselves and we're living in a family, if there is some kind of ongoing, chronic, developmental, um, emotionally being ignored, that when we are by ourselves, when we are spending a lot of time by ourselves, usually we're internally, we have so much time to um, fine tune the skill of our own emotional awareness because we're not engaging with other people. So we turn it inward and we are engaging ourselves. Now, I want to acknowledge that the opposite happens also. The opposite, there's a whole group of people who they um, do just the opposite, where they don't hone the skill to be emotionally intelligent or emotionally sophisticated. They're not uh, quick to go into their self-reflective place of wondering who they are, and they do just the opposite. They um, disengage from themselves, and so they do not have that much of you know, emotional awareness or emotional intelligence. So when we're in this family where there's some kind of ongoing experience of being ignored, we have to learn, we figure out we're just gonna overcompensate. We're gonna emotionally do the work for two people in because the other people that we're in relationship with the other family members are not participating and joining us in that place. So there's an overcompensation. So the origin of that is also driven by anxiety. If you're in a family where you're being ignored from time to time, whether you're conscious of it or not, whether you can fully let it in, there is an ongoing low level, sometimes high, high level, but there's a kind of ongoing chronic low level anxiety of these people are not connecting to me. They're just not connecting. Like, hello, hello, I'm here. So naturally, what how a person is gonna to respond to that anxiety is you have to do something about it. And one way is we can start to behave in a kind of nervousness, a kind of a nervousness that comes out in our emotional inquisitiveness, our emotional engagement, so that we are oversharing to overcompensate for the person who's not engaging. And by doing so, we're also attempting to comfort our own underlying anxiety. So that when I actually overshare, when I am more emotionally open, I'm comforting the, the simultaneous anxiety that I'm feeling by noticing that the person I'm with is not engaging back. 
So that speaks to the origin of how this would get set up. But I'm, I'm sure you can see how this is a, a skill. This is a kind of training that we're trained to overcompensate emotionally in relationship with people who don't engage. So as adults, I'm sure that you could see as an adult, this is not a skill that really serves us because we lack the ability to notice the appropriate social cues and to wait for mutual uh, exchange and mutual engagement from the person that we're with. And if we are unable to really be honest with ourselves about how vulnerability uh, creates anxiety, and in those moments of pause, or it's referred to as the gap, when there's a gap in emotional connection, uh, we will experience anxiety in that gap. And instead of being able to slow down and comfort ourselves and manage the intensity of the anxiety, we will override that moment by talking a little more, by uh, attempting to create deeper connection, um, more authentic connection with the person that we're with because our history of those gaps in the emotional exchange were so drawn out and prolonged and lasted for unbearable periods of time in our childhood. So we were conditioned to um, respond rather quickly when we notice there's some kind of gap in emotional connection because it signals, oh no, this is a place where I'm going to be ignored. This is a place where I am going to be emotionally neglected. This is a place for some of us, it even feels like emotional abandonment. So our skill, our style of emotional oversharing is mostly for many of us, a adaptive response. We have had to adapt to scenarios in a situation with people who do not fully engage. And we take this adaptive skill and now we bring it into our adult, uh, adult relationships. And I'm assuming you can see how this is not helpful because it pushes people away. And it means that our emotional sharing is not congruent with the, um, mutual investment of both people negotiating. Well, let's go there together. Let's go into deeper emotional connection together instead of me driving the bus and just taking us there right away. And again, to repeat the point, sometimes the intention for doing so is the opposite of actually creating emotional connection. It's being driven uh, by the need to push the other person away or to, to safeguard my, to safeguard the level of vulnerability uh, so that I am in control. I can be in control of this emotional experience, this, this emotional exchange. If I overshare early on, and if I show myself to be emotionally sophisticated, emotionally intelligent, and there's going to create a kind of barrier or a wall because the person's going to know, the other person that I'm with knows, well, there's a threshold here and my threshold is rather high. And if you want to connect with me, you have to be willing minimally to start at my higher level of emotional engagement. Most people will find this off-putting. Most people will, not most, I'm just saying, you know, many people, not most, many people can find this off-putting and many people can um, feel there's a subtle manipulation in this. Again, it's not conscious. I'm not trying to consciously manipulate someone, but I'm manipulating the degree to which I'm actually going to be emotionally vulnerable and emotionally open. And by setting the bar so high, setting the standard so high, where even the minimal level of relating, you need to cross this threshold, it almost guarantees that I'm uh, going to have few or fewer um, emotionally connected relationships. So in a way I'm 
playing out and acting out and repeating the same thing I had in my family, which is um, multiple experiences throughout my daily life, uh, in my life, multiple uh, relationships that are going to fall short of having a real authentic uh, emotional exchange or mutual emotional exchange. Lastly, I want to talk about a couple ways to approach this in the spirit of healing, in the spirit of a kind of how to uh, begin to undo this pattern. Um, the first idea is very practical, and that's in its pause. We need to pause. We need to slow down. You need to take time to allow the gap in the relating, uh, notice when there's a shift and a transition and there's not emotional connection, that if some anxiety is there, that we pause and we slow down and we're able to begin to notice the lack or the, the, dis, the, the, the uh, moments of non-emotional exchange. Those are the moments that we find rather uncomfortable and triggering and uh, anxiety provoking. So the very first um, uh, practical way to think about working with oversharing is learn how to pause. Just stop talking. Just stop sharing. And take a moment to exhale. The next idea I want to share is we have to wait for the invitations. We have to notice the invitations. So for a person who overshares, we are often the ones who take the lead. We are the ones who initiate the um, moments, the invitations to connect, uh, to share on an emotional level. We need to practice the opposite. We need to observe it in other people, uh, the person that we're with, uh, in an exchange, in a moment, waiting when you're invited to share. And there's a real satisfaction that you're going to notice. There will be a congruency in the moment. There will be an invitation to... Um, the other person wants to know you. They want to know your experience. And you don't have to work so hard to uh, bring it right away. You don't have to work so hard uh, to bring more of yourself. You are enough in that moment. And if you can pause and slow down and work with those gaps, those moments where there's not, uh, there's a break in the emotional connection, other people will invite you in. And then it's your job to, um, through some kind of slow disclosure, a kind of intentional disclosure, um, offer some emotional exchange and then wait for the other person to do it back. So it's very intentional. The third idea uh, that I want to share is pick the right people. This is not going to work if you choose people who are emotionally closed and distant and shut down and lack some emotional intelligence of their own. Oftentimes we pick people who are emotionally disengaged, again, because it comes from our family system, it comes from our history, it comes from our childhood. It's just what we know. We're very comfortable. We have a very high tolerance for being with people who do not engage emotionally. And, and so therefore we um, take our adaptive skill, our adaptive style of overcompensating and oversharing, and we simply fill in the blanks. We're, we're, we do the work for them. We're doing the emotional work for two people, which also you'll, you'll know that's why many times it's incredibly um, emotionally draining uh, because we're, we're essentially um, having a, a relationship with ourself and we are, we are the actor that is being cast in both parts, in both roles, and we're not only overcompensating in our own emotional disclosure, but now we're trying to make up for the other person's lack of emotional engagement. So the last 
piece of, uh, or, or, or the, to repeat a kind of how to work with this is really have to inventory who are, the, who are these people that you're picking and, and, and what level of skill do the people in your life have to emotionally engage with you. And if you do an inventory and realize that you do not have too many of them, um, that's very good information. It tells you you need to go out in the world and find some new friends. You need to go out in the world and find some new organizations where it's built into the culture that a kind of um, emotional availability and emotional presence is welcome. And uh, there's many ways to go about doing this um, uh, to make yourself available. Let people know, you know that you're looking for new friends. Uh, join some new groups. Um, find a new set of people that you can experiment and practice uh, with someone who's able to go there with you. Um, those are the types of relationships uh, that would then give us reassurance that we don't have to overcompensate and we don't have to overshare. Thank you so much for watching this video. Uh, if you like this idea and want to talk about it more, there is a Facebook group that you're welcome to join. It is called The New Love Addiction and uh, you will find it. Um, I'll put the URL here in this video. Also, if you, um, I work with clients remotely via telephone and through video, and if perhaps you're looking for relationship coaching, you can learn more about me at alanrobarge.com. And then finally, uh, don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel. There are more videos coming up with similar ideas such as this. I hope this uh, video was helpful, and thank you for watching, and I will see you next time. Bye.